can hop in as they go. Great. So hello, everybody. Welcome to the, the keynote address for the symposium. Um, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, I'm really happy to, to have Dave Anderson, uh, I guess, Dr. Dave Anderson. I don't know if I've ever called Dave Dr. Dave Anderson before. Um, yeah. A good friend of mine from college who, uh, as you see in his bio here, works for the Child Mind Institute as the Senior Director of National Programs. Um, what you won't see in his bio is that Dave was a mentor for four years in college um, with the DREAM program uh, at Dartmouth and also worked for DREAM for a couple of years as a camp director. Um, and so has, has some experience, not only all this experience you see here, but experience in mentoring as well. And we're really happy to have him here joining us to, to, to talk with us today and, and also have some time at the end to answer questions. So I'm going to turn things over to you, Dave, and let you share screen and, and you can take it away. Sounds good. Thank you, Chad. Uh, I'm going to share here. That's my family. Now I'm getting the PowerPoint presentation off. All right. Um, so folks, Chad, thank you for that. Yes, I was going to say that uh, my, my start in all of this work was actually getting recruited by uh, Mike Foote of the Dream Program as a college freshman into mentoring. At that time, uh, I wasn't even majoring in psychology, hadn't yet decided to become a clinical psychologist got into mentoring for uh, all four years in college. And Chad and I had the privilege of working together in the Dream Office in Burlington and uh, being a camp director for Camp Dream in AmeriCorps Vista for a few years. Uh, then I went to grad school in New York. That was where I got my uh, doctorate in clinical psychology. Uh, then worked out in LA for a few years exclusively with kids in foster and adoptive care uh, in, in the entire kind of Los Angeles region. Um, and then I was recruited back actually in my current position at Child Mind. Uh, where I oversee uh, school and community programs, uh, where we provide direct service with a kind of comprehensive suite of services in over 200 schools uh, each year in New York and San Francisco. Uh, and then we also provide uh, services to school districts and schools and community organizations uh, across the country, mainly centered around training for professionals around mental health topics, uh, psychoeducation for parents around how they can support their kids uh, around mental health and learning disorders, uh, classroom coaching and in school coaching, and then also uh, treatment services in schools that are provided free of charge because of the way that we're funded uh, to the patients we treat uh, for post traumatic stress, uh, mood disorders, behavior disorders, attention disorders, and learning disorders. Uh, so, this is one talk that, uh, or at least a topic we've been talking about a lot during COVID, particularly to people in helping professions, um, where what we're trying to uh, highlight are strategies that folks can still use, even if they're working from uh, a distance or they're only connecting with uh, students or mentees that they serve uh, through digital means or through kind of video conferencing, uh, and also skills that they can foster in kids to manage stress and uncertainty this time, during this time. So you don't have to be a psychologist or mental health professional to utilize the strategies I'm gonna talk about in the latter half of the presentation. So what I'm gonna try to do is spend about just kind of five minutes talking about the research on uh, COVID and setting the scene. And actually, I'll, I'll talk about that when I get to the agenda here. So let me, let me get to that. So just the Child Mind Institute, the organization where I work, I've already talked about our work a bit, but these are kind of the three pillars. Uh, we do research on objective markers of children's uh, mental health and learning disorders, uh, as well as the uh, application through technology uh, of kind of therapeutic intervention. So we develop apps and things like that that can be used. Um, our clinical care is focused on specialized evidence-based interventions for different child and adolescent mental health and learning disorders. And then the aspect that I get to captain uh, is part of that clinical care as well as our public education arm uh, that focuses on getting information to people who need it uh, and who are in supporting roles for kids. So this is the agenda for today. Uh, I wanna reflect on some of the challenges youth are facing for you know, eight to 10 minutes. Um, and then really the focus of this presentation is kind of centering ourselves on the understanding that growth and wellness and support tend to stem from strong relationships and to then remind ourselves of what evidence-based tools we have to build relationships even during a time like this. Then to talk about stress management strategies we can utilize with mentees, either through you know, video conferencing or phone calls or uh, distance-focused uh, support, or if we are finding safe ways to see mentees in person, uh, these stress management strategies can be things that we discuss and practice you know, together in vivo. Uh, and then what I'm gonna ask of all of you at the end of this, before we get to the question and answer portion, is that you engage in a two to three minute exercise with me, thinking about how you might take one or two strategies from this presentation and apply it in some sort of manageable way 
for yourself, for a mentee, for a member of your organization, uh, with your partner, any number of ways that you can apply these strategies, but to set some sort of clear and deliverable goal for yourself. So with that, the challenges youth are facing during COVID. So the way that we can think about this particular new normal is from the, the frame of uncertainty. So what I, what I wanna highlight in thinking about this is that what's difficult for kids to understand, and make no mistake, if you're talking to a kid or a teenager, it is better to be open with them about the struggles that we are all facing. It is better to talk to them about it. Uh, kids do better when they're not in the dark. Uh, so in that sense, as we're open about what we're facing, we also wanna be open about the fact that uncertainty is the most difficult facet of dealing with something like a pandemic. Now, the most difficult facets of the pandemic aren't actually the pandemic itself, it's the myriad effects on communities, and I'm gonna talk about the next slide. But it is okay, and this is what we wanna kind of normalize for kids, that in the midst of such an invisible and uncertain kind of thing, anxiety is expected. There's gonna be good days and not so good days. We're all gonna have them. And it's normal for all of us to kind of mourn the loss of typical and normal routines and to sit with that because it's really rough. Like, for example, we've been in this pandemic six months. Uh, today is actually the first day when I'll be having lunch with an adult friend, even in social distancing, in six months. I'm really excited for it because I've been mourning the loss of normal routines. I'm having fr actually lunch with a friend of Chad and mine named John, and we're going to be, you know, six feet apart, still with face masks on, we're not eating. But it's amazing to feel like there's some sense of normalcy we can get back, while at the same time, we just kind of have to sit with that loss as well. And that's true of us and anybody we serve. The other thing that I'm going to be highlighting during this presentation, this goes back to the fundamental kind of underlying theories of psychological intervention, is that our thoughts, the way we interpret events, the running monologue that happens in our head, the feelings that we experience, and the behaviors we engage in are all really interconnected. So anytime that we deal with stress, it's usually addressing one of these three things, how we're thinking, how we're feeling, or how we're behaving, and knowing that there's a cascade that changes the other two of those things, depending on what strategy we choose to employ. So again, in terms of setting the stage for parents, this is really the slide that summarizes what's happened during this pandemic related to uh, COVID's kind of cascading mental health effects. So if you think about what happened around March or April, particularly in communities of color, particularly in communities that were low socioeconomic status or already didn't have significant wealth, uh, what we watched was immediately schools closed down and there was this loss of childcare. Parents are suddenly playing new and multiple roles, even as they're trying to maintain their jobs, whether they're essential, uh, frontline workers, whether they're working in medical professions or whether they're all of a sudden working from home. And particularly for those that a safety net, there was a huge effect of the economic paralysis and then uh, worsening in the sense that uh, millions of people saw massive financial insecurity, uh, job insecurity, job losses, uh, and housing insecurity. Those stressors are the stressors and are the way that we characterize the kind of tra possible traumatic effects of COVID. Just having a pandemic isn't itself a trauma. It's a universal stressor for the population. So when people describe COVID as a trauma, that's not true. It hasn't been universally traumatic for the population. Uh, and it's actually, it's, it's representative of what we call colloquial creep. It's sort of how people will say, uh, I'm feeling so OCD today or something like that. It's not necessarily what a mental health professional would define that as. It's more about what we should be on the lookout for in terms of the cascade. It's that these factors have affected communities disproportionately. For many families who have been affluent during uh, COVID, uh, even with the loss of childcare, they've been able, and a lot has been written about this in major news articles, they've been able to, net, to hire replacement child care, they've been able to put their children in pods, the parents have been able to figure out ways of keeping their job security, even in the midst of all that we're experiencing. So it's really important that we think about the differential effect that COVID has had on the population. And that means that there's also been differential risk. So the second level down here, the increased parent stress and mental health symptoms are coming from these factors in many cases. There is a huge loss of typical avenues of emotional support and social support, and there's a worry and uncertainty about the future. When we first began the pandemic, many people believed that it was gonna involve two weeks of social distancing and then life would be to some degree back to normal. That clearly has not occurred. Even in states like Vermont, where the infectivity rate has stayed low, or at least where social distancing and population density has allowed for a slower spread. The, the last and, and, and kind of final category is what we've seen in the kids that we serve, which is that because of this cascade of factors, we've seen a huge increase 
in child and teen emotional stress, a huge increase in parent stress. This is what the research has showed us and significantly increased family conflict in families that have seen these factors affect them. And we have to be really mindful of that in thinking about how we support uh, you know, kids through the relationships that we have with them and through the kind of stress management that we engage in. So with that, as kind of a setting of the stage, this is the moment where we try to be mindful for a second. It's that we cannot solve the last slide. This is where we kind of slow down on this. There is no way necessarily to solve this pandemic. There's no way to solve this pandemic uh, in spite of the kind of lack of leadership uh, that we've had in the ways that we've publicly addressed uh, various aspects of the slide that I just showed, uh, that I've just shown. So in, in that sense, we have to focus in on the localized efforts that we make as individuals or as small organizations or as collectives. It's what efforts are we going to day to day to help people through this because we can't control the future and we've got to chunk our efforts in the span of a few days to a week. And this is really how people are going to get through this because the, the circumstances change so quickly. So what I want you to think about in this mindful moment it's just the fact that the focus of a presentation like this isn't to solve the slide that I just showed. It's to think about what in the next week one might do to support people who are close to them. And that's what I hope you take from this. So with that, uh, let's launch into the kinds of relationship building tools and techniques uh, that you still have at your disposal, whether you're working from a distance with the mentees that you serve or whether you're able to find safe ways to meet in person. So first, this is a very busy slide. I also want to preface that like for every slide that I, I make during presentations, I try to make it so that even if you didn't hear me talk about it, it's like a handout. And I've also given Chad a PDF of all of my slides. For those of you who may be trying to take screenshots or any of that kind of stuff, I'm happy to release those slides, uh, you know, just as, as a way of kind of referencing back with the communities you serve or with uh, the employees that you work with or, or other mentors, uh, the kinds of talking points that you can think about for how you serve your mentees. So the first thing for relationship building is that you set the tone with your own emotion regulation. So what kids are looking to right now are adults who can regulate their emotions in these situations. Now it's important that emotion regulation doesn't mean not showing kids vulnerability. It doesn't mean not showing kids that you're having trouble or that you're having trouble coping. It just means that you show them that there's possibilities in the midst of all the emotions you're having to regulate and manage that kind of stress. So first thing about setting the tone is, set, is providing age appropriate information. It's that, you know, especially for mentors, we obviously want to be in consultation with a kid's caregivers, a mentee's caregivers, about what kind of information they're sharing. But it's important to be able to share that age appropriate information, let them know some of what's going on. If they're a young kid, it's often just a few facts. There's a sickness that's going around, it's called the coronavirus. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's a risk for young children like you, but we're all doing things to keep each other safe uh, and to make it so that the sickness doesn't spread, particularly because people who are older or who might have other health conditions you know, might, be, uh, might get a little bit uh, much more sick if they were to get this. And those are kind of the talking points that we might give young kids. Teenagers can handle a bit more. One of the things that we see with mentees and with any kids that we serve, especially during a pandemic like this, is if the slide that I presented earlier is any sort of indication of the stress that's occurring for mentees, that's occurring in families, what's increasingly important is that when we see behavior from kids that's challenging or that's rejecting of our help or that can be difficult or where we see kids getting irritable with us because they themselves are stressed, what's really important is A, that we stay regulated in those tough situations and interactions. The easiest way that I stay regulated with uh, kids tends to be either leading myself through a quick perspective taking exercise. What's their week been? What's it been like for them? What's their family been experiencing? Why might they be coming at me right now on this? Why might they be feeling irritable? I specialize in working with kids with ADHD and behavioral difficulties. So in a lot of ways, the kids that I, I work with uh, tend to, to you know, deal with emotion by acting out. And frequently, my compassion mantra for that is I just tell myself they're just a kid. I will also say that this is my compassion mantra for my four-year-old as well, when he's throwing stuff at me or telling me last night that the bathwater was too hot and too cold in varying degrees and yelling at me for you know, a good period of 10 minutes. I just keep reminding myself they're just kids. This is the best they've got in terms of emotion regulation. And my job is to model for them what might be possible at a later developmental stage. The other thing we wanna model for kids is the balance between acceptance and change. So in that sense, there are certain things we can change. There are certain things we can actively cope with. 
during a pandemic like this or during the kinds of stressors we're seeing. There are certain things we just have to accept. It is a serenity prayer. We don't have control over how long it's going to take for a vaccine to happen. We don't have control over how long it's going to take for life to go back to normal. But we can commit to change what we can in small pockets. And it's important to model that duality for kids, that there are certain things we accept, and we just got to kind of tolerate the distress that comes along with them. And there are certain things that we can shift or change or problem solve. The next thing is, when we think about how adults can set the tone, it's psychological first aid. When you're in a really stressful situation, what you want to do with somebody is focus on concrete needs first. Have they eaten? Have they gotten some rest? Have they gotten water? Have they hydrated? Are we safe? It's those concrete needs. You problem solve the things that are hardest right now, usually along the line of those particular needs. And then beyond that, you try to figure out how can I set up some structure that helps us get through the next few days? What are we going to knock down just of those first couple to do items that are going to get us to a place we feel like we're a little bit more on top of the stressors that we're seeing? We're not going to solve everything all at once. That's what we get down to with psychological first aid, with people who are really in dire straits. Concrete needs, focus only on the next couple days, what schedule we're going to set up, what we're going to knock down, and just the things that are hardest. Try to put everything else out of our minds as much as we can, even though we know somebody might be ruminating to no end. The next thing as well, especially with kids, is that how we set the tone around questions is important. We might give them information. We might tell them that you know, we're trying to balance acceptance and, and you know, trying to figure out what we can change. The key for adults is also realizing one good conversation doesn't really do much of anything. We know this as therapists. I'll think at the end of a session, my God, I've said so many great things to this kid. You know, clearly, they're going to take that forward, and they're going to do really well with it. What I'm surprised at constantly is A, that the, what they took away from the session is completely different from what I took away from the session, not to mention the number of times I need to continue to come back to a topic, open it up to questions or further you know, ongoing conversation. And that really my, my point of intervention isn't so much in a brilliant thing I might say or a brilliant thought I might throw out there. It's in just being there consistently. The last thing I'll talk about related to setting the tone is really thinking about leaving a kid laughing at the end of certain experiences. Part of this is that when we do, when we have difficult conversations, when we try to keep things kind of, uh, you know, in, in a space where we can have uh, tough conversations and really go in depth about how someone's dealing with stress, frequently the way that someone will come back to that conversation again is if they feel like there was an ability to return to something light at the end of it, that it didn't end with just the heaviness of it, and that they were left with that feeling. People like to be conditioned, especially because of a memory effect called the recency effect, to think that the last thing that was said was sort of light and fun, or the last conversation was, or the last activity you had was sort of light and fun. There's a psychologist who talks about leaving deep conversations with a kid by, by leaving it with laughter. That's kind of what I'm referencing. And in, in that sense, what I would plan for is having some sort of fun activity at the end. Now, granted, with teenagers, they're, they're more able to leave things heavy at the end and to just kind of say like, okay, this has been a tough conversation. You know, let's, let's wrap this up and realize we don't have to kind of solve it or tie it up in a bow going forward. But particularly with young children, there's this sense that like, you know, it's easier to then think positively about coming to the next conversation with you if the last activity itself was somewhat light. So just one last piece on, on kind of setting the tone. Genuous, genuineness and authenticity have never been more valuable than during the kind of, uh, you know, support activities that we're doing with kids during the pandemic. So I've already highlighted this idea of teaching and modeling kind of what you're doing, but when appropriate, narrate what you're doing with your own stressful situations. Now, this isn't necessarily like in sort of a one-up way, like we don't necessarily tell kids like what we're handling related to say our own financial stresses or difficulties with our partners or families. It's more that when you're engaging a stressful situation with them or when you're trying to solve a situation with them you want to narrate your own emotional reactions or your own wrestling with different solutions that you're trying to think about the reason why you do that is it facilitates a mentee or a kid seeing that as part of problem solving that you just put out there kind of what you're feeling in that moment or what kinds of solutions you're trying to think through and similarly, even if you can't pull somebody into that idea of kind of identifying their emotions or identifying what you're wrestling with in terms of what you're solving, you can also build just kind of like quick social emotional skills into any meeting you might have with a mentee. The two that we really like are, especially if we're gonna have a quick meeting with a kid, thinking about like, okay, can we build in here a mindful minute 
or just like one moment to focus on something mindfully and slow down, whether it's a deep breath or a moment that we uh, felt a success earlier or some moment that we enjoyed together. And similarly, can we do something where even at the beginning or end of interactions, we do like a temperature check, like rating our level of stress and rating our level of enjoyment on a scale of one to 10 and seeing like kind of how that is. I emphasize rating stress and enjoyment or kind of like a negative emotion or a positive emotion, partly because what it emphasizes to kids is that you can feel more emotions than just one emotion at once. And this often is like, you know, shown through all kinds of emotion laden books that kids might read. One of my favorites is Double Dip Feelings, which emphasizes to kids that you can have emotions that are like ice cream scoops on an ice cream cone. You can have just one scoop on the cone, but you can also have multiple scoops because you're feeling multiple emotions. So again, building those kind of SEL skills or those kinds of check-ins into meetings can help to build relationships and also set you up as someone who's really there to process emotions. So the next couple slides are getting into just a couple relationship building blocks that we have with kids before I launch into some stress management strategies you can work on with your mentee. So in terms of relationship building blocks, what I want people to realize, because I think a lot of adults are hamstrung to some degree right now by this feeling that they're interacting with a lot of the kids that they serve through screens or through social distancing, or that they're not capable of doing a lot of the same things they would do uh, in supporting the communities they work with. The next couple slides are to remind people that many of the relationship building blocks that help us to form strong attachments are still as available to us as ever with people, even if we're wearing a face mask, even with a social distance, even if it's happening over Zoom. So how we form strong attachments as humans, it's this first four bullet points. We form strong attachments because we're present. That can happen over Zoom, even if all of us are fatigued by Zoom, even if we're fatigued by interactions over Zoom. It's that we're present and we're consistent. And presence also similarly is just undivided attention. It's that it is rare for many kids to go through the world and feel like their teachers, or parents or caregivers are truly giving them undivided attention. You know, when we do uh, treatment with parents, one of the interventions that has been shown in the research to be most effective is merely getting parents to spend five minutes with their kids when they're not doing any other household task, following the kids' lead in activity, and their cell phone is in another room. That alone is a level of presence that kids are just not used to from adults that they're with. And it's massively facilitative of forming strong attachments. Similarly, interest in what a kid's doing. So, you know, kids, especially when busy adults are kind of around them, are, are somewhat surprised when the adult is really interested in whatever activity that they're doing. And so just staying interested, even for a three to five minute period in whatever the child is doing, whether you're, they're screen sharing with you and you're watching them do something or they've switched their screen and so you're watching their room and you're watching them do some sort of activity, you're doing some sort of Zoom, on Zoom activity together, or some social distancing activity, that interest is huge for forming attachment. Another way we form attachment, and I've already kind of emphasized this in the first couple slides around emotion regulation and modeling, is that kids are gravitating toward people whose character and conduct they believe are things they would like to emulate. So they watch, and this gets to what I'm talking about at the bottom of the slide here, they watch adults who are emotionally regulated, they watch adults whose interactions with others are characterized by respect and dignity, are characterized by consideration, are characterized by modeling of social mores or things that we're all doing for public health and safety right now. They gravitate toward the people who seem in their interactions, in their interactions to be safe and supportive of others. They also gravitate toward people whose reactions to typical behavior for a child's developmental stage uh, is fairly emotionally regulated. So in that sense, like when a kid behaves typically, as in if they're a toddler and they're throwing a tantrum, and we kind of ignore that for a moment, model calm and try to help the toddler to figure out either how they're gonna cope or how we're gonna help them to get out of it. That says to a kid, you are a massively reliable attachment figure for me. Because when I do something that's particularly developmentally appropriate, you're not phased, you don't think that I'm necessarily doing it to get under your skin, you just kind of react in a way that helps me to figure out how I can maybe develop some skills as I mature to get better at this. I've already kind of referenced the reliability and frequency of interactions, but there is so much to be said, and this is true of all mentoring relationships, just for showing up. I can't tell you how many times in my time as a mentor, uh, in my time as a psychologist in training, uh, or as my time as just a human being trying to serve people I care about, the, the thing that seems most predictive of relationship building 
is just showing up and waiting, being there for somebody while they're trying to get through something. Or, or even while they might not be reacting to my showing up that well, but they know that I'm still gonna show up the next day too. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna talk about on a kind of future slide is just that in terms of strong attachments, Diana Baumrind, who's a, a theorist who talks a lot about parenting styles you may have heard about, where she talks about, uh, and, and I should say this in the past tense, she talked about permissive, authoritative, and authoritarian parenting styles, where you're looking at this kind of continuum of nurturance and support. What attachment figures for children are looking for is ways to balance the ways that they provide structure to a kid and boundaries and safety with the baseline which should be providing nurturance and support most of the time. And I'm gonna talk about that uh, one slide from now. So just, I've referenced a couple times the fact that quality time is so important for relationship building. Whether you are on Zoom or you're engaging in some sort of socially distanced in-person activity, again, the basic building blocks of quality time, just being attentive and present to the kid's experience, just following their lead, and that can happen when you're doing some sort of fun activity over Zoom, it can also happen when you're socially distanced, wearing face masks and can't even go in for a high five or you know, a pound. It's just following their lead. They're talking about something and you're listening and letting them drive the conversation or they're doing an activity and you're letting them lead that particular activity. For those of us who are engaging in socially distanced interactions with kids right now, especially those say eight or younger, literally just taking a walk outside with a kid right now and letting them just decide to do whatever they're doing with nature and what they find is immensely facilitative of relationship building. It's just following the kid's lead, letting them pick up pine cones and talk about them. Um, there's a huge amount of, relation, of attachment building that comes just from what we call cultivation of common interests and interactional rituals. So for any of you who've built relationship with kids, what you know is that kids like to do the same thing repeatedly when building relationships. And that is completely normal. I can't tell you the number of calls I've gotten from parents over the course of my career where they're worried about the fact that their kid seems to want to engage in rituals over and over. Like one of the first patients I ever treated, the mother called up very concerned that her four-year-old only ever wanted to go to Pizza Hut after school. And she said, is this a symptom of autism? And I said, absolutely not. What happens at Pizza Hut? She said, oh, well, you know, we go by ourselves. We don't bring his brother. Uh, he gets to play a few of the video games in the back. We get to have pizza together. And he tells me about what's going on at school. And I say, so what you're telling me is that Pizza Hut involves his undivided attention from his mother while also getting to engage in an activity he finds massively reinforcing with the video games in the back while also eating one of his favorite foods. Like, I would make that my attachment ritual with you as well. And, you know, people understand that. So if you find that you and a mentee are doing the same thing on Zoom or in person over and over, that's normal. That's, that's, that's your attachment right there. It's that we want kids to be able to say, you know, when we ask them, what do you do with your mentor? And they say, you know, I do this and I do this. And those are unique activities that we share. That's still very much available to us during this time. Again, the other thing that quality time looks like is if a kid needs support or if a kid needs to solve a problem, you're available and your attention isn't distracted by something else. And that's huge in terms of its unconscious transmission to a kid that you are an attachment figure who is there for them. The last slide I'll show just on relationship building skills is breaking down these kinds of nurturance and structure skills that are so increasingly helpful for building attachment. So in terms of structure, what mentors are still doing, even in any interaction, is they're setting the expectations for interaction, how it's going to be structured, you know, what kinds of activities are choices within that particular interaction, and that helps. Kids thrive when there's some walls around an interaction. Uh, at the same time, you know, whether you're interacting over Zoom or whether you're interacting, uh, you know, through social distancing, promoting adherence to rules when necessary is helpful in attachment building for kids. One of the things we see with people who engage in, uh, uh, you know, teaching jobs, mentoring jobs, uh, any kind of kind of community organization, is that people are often surprised at how much kids gravitate toward the attachment figures who balance a kind of baseline where they spend, you know, a good 75% of their time nurturing but at the same time, really do set boundaries when they need to. Kids don't gravitate toward permissive attachment figures as much as they gravitate toward people who are balanced, who let them know when they're running up against a rule and you know, gently kind of nudge them back into that space where they're safe. Again, that's because rules also signify safety, that you care about keeping your kids safe, that you care about making sure that you're watching them 
and that you care about making sure that they're engaging in the things that are going to keep them safe, that are going to keep their relationships on a positive level with their friends and others. In terms of nurturing skills, the things that are still available to people right now are every single kind of verbalization that we engage with kids, that, that we engage in with kids that also facilitates this kind of nurturing. So when we talk about nurturing skills, you can validate the emotions they're feeling. You can describe what they're doing. So in that sense, you can narrate it like a play-by-play -play announcer. You can say like, oh, I see you're picking up a rock. Oh, you're picking up that rock and you're putting it over there. Oh, you're putting some leaves on top of that rock. You're telling me you're burying this rock and you're making this sort of like a pirate's treasure. All you're doing is narrating what they're actually doing. Now, the second skill that I just demonstrated is reflection, which is once they tell you something about what they're doing, you can just paraphrase it. And that just shows them how much you're with them in their experience. Ah, you're telling me that you're burying this and this is your pirate treasure. You can even maybe switch into a pirate's voice. Ah, matey, I see that you're putting those leaves there on top of your treasure. These are all things that are extremely possible, whether you're social distancing in person. They're also extremely possible even if you're interacting over a video screen. So in that sense, if a kid turns their video screen around and is having you watch them do an activity or something like that that you're also doing on the other side of the screen, you can narrate what they're doing. Like, oh yeah, I see that as you're drawing, like you're drawing this kind of yellow line. Oh yeah, that line is actually the beginning of the horizon. Oh, so you're telling me that's the horizon. You're just narrating what you see and then you're reflecting what they tell you about it. The other thing too is that, and this relates to a talk you're gonna get a little bit later on, I think in this conference around growth mindset, you can also give positive feedback around things you see them doing around perseverance or around like pro-social behavioral skills. So in that sense, if they're doing something nice for some other person or they're doing something considerate or they're engaging in a behavior that really involves a high level of effort or perseverance, that's facilitative of great personal skills for a kid and you can really highlight that. Like I really like how you're trying a number of different ways to work on finishing this drawing or trying to figure out how you can draw that face the way that you were liking, you know, or the way that you were envisioning it. Those are the kinds of behaviors we wanna give positive feedback. Again, kids love to build relationships with adults who can show them those kinds of nurturing skills. So I'm gonna spend the next 10 minutes before I pause for questions, just talking about how, you know, if we think about the phases of this talk, we've got what kids are facing during COVID, we have what's still at your disposal as an adult in terms of building relationships with those kids and setting the tone. And then we also have skills that you can teach kids for stress management during this time. So the first, and you can go back to this slide and reference it. If you're doing a mental health check-in with a mentee, this is what we think of as the mental health check-in for COVID. It's first, are they adhering to public health guidelines? You know, are they doing okay on whatever they and their family have decided is gonna keep them safe? That already is a mental health check-in. Next, what are they doing around basic wellness practices? What we know is that mental health is so inextricably linked to sleep, exercise, and eating and hydration. Now, importantly, none of those things are a treatment for a mental health disorder, but they help everyone's mental health. So we always wanna check in with any human being about how they're doing with that and kind of try to problem solve around it if we can or set goals if we can, because if they're not engaging in those basic wellness practices, it's very unlikely their mental health is at the optimal place it could be, even in the midst of all that's going on. Especially with older teens, older kids and adults, limiting news exposure at this time has been shown to be linked to mental health. So in that sense, we want people to know what's going on. We want people to know what's going on with systemic injustice, uh, anti-racist practices, and, and police brutality in this country. We want people to know what's going on with upcoming elections. We want them to know what's going on with the Supreme Court. But at the same time, limiting news exposure in a time of such high stress can be helpful in ensuring that people are at least informed, but not overly made anxious by the amount of news that they're consuming. Structure in the schedule, even in the midst of a time when structure is quite impossible, uh, is extremely helpful for people's mental health. So even just breaking out their day and saying, when are you waking up? When are you having breakfast? What are you planning on doing between breakfast and lunch? You know, what's on your list? What's one mood boosting activity you could do? What's one thing you need to do? Those things, especially in giving structure, can have been shown to be incredibly linked to boosting mood and to improvements in mental health. Uh, you ask somebody, how are you engaging in safe social contact? If they're a family that's strictly social distancing, let's talk about how they're using what they have at their disposal in terms of technology, if they have reliable wireless, if they have the ability to video conference, if it's just a phone call. Like, what do they have in terms of safe social contact all the way up to safe social distancing interactions uh, in person with people? 
And then finally, how are they using a variety of coping strategies that we can teach in short bursts? So the coping strategies we teach, the first is merely about emotion identification and monitoring. So you can teach any kid this strategy. You can teach them this strategy by watching Inside Out together. So talking about an activity you can do with a mentee, even over Zoom, is that like Netflix and many streaming services even have the opportunity now to co-watch a particular thing and talk about it. Inside Out, and I'm not making a promotion of Disney or Disney movies or anything like that, I'm just saying Inside Out from Pixar is a movie that does pretty well at breaking down the five primary emotional categories that we as humans have. And then those emotions all flow from these kind of five primary categories in terms of the uh, complexity of language that we get to around our emotions. So teaching a kid to be able to identify where they are in terms of the inside out emotions, or if they're a teenager, of course, you're using a little bit more adult language around this, really helps for coping strategies just in general. Because most humans don't pause during the day and get in touch with themselves as to where they are emotionally. Now I want to talk about the skill that has you pause and get in touch with yourself. Once you get someone to a point where they're reading and writing, you know, junior high and above, where they're reading and writing so well that they may be able to kind of do a sort of tracker for themselves. You know, young kids, what we tend to do is use icons or pictures that they might point to to identify an emotion, or we often use emojis these days. Um, with older kids, we try to get them to engage in a little bit of an emotional journaling thing, because this is a massively important skill for stress management. So what we ask kids is we say, let's set reminders on your phone, or let's figure out a time when I'm going to text you, you know, during each day when we're both going to check in with ourselves, where we're just going to say, okay, what's going on right now? What emotions am I feeling? And what's the kind of intensity level that I'm feeling? This is an incredibly important exercise because people do not gather data on themselves and where they are emotionally. And when someone starts to gather data about where they are emotionally at any time, that tends to inform what kinds of stress management strategies they can apply for themselves. But just noticing, just being mindful of those emotions is a hugely important stress management skill because it says to you, okay, what are the times in the day that I'm noticing patterns where I'm most nervous or where I'm most irritated or where I'm, I'm most calm? What am I doing around those times? What can I do more of that would help me to either have more of this particular emotion or less of this particular emotion? So once we see that people have gathered data, we look at kind of like lines, or at least I think of kind of graphs that they might have throughout the day of these peaks and troughs where like maybe their emotions are at a neutral or positive state during some point. But then at the same time, they might have moments where their emotions are really low. The frontline strategy for coping with stress with teenagers is what we call behavioral activation, which is just a fancy term for create a list of fun activities, some of which that might take one minute, some of which might take three minutes, some of which might take 10 to 30 minutes, and then figure out how you can pepper in in your day, if you can, in those kind of low moments, those de-stressing activities or mood boosting activities. And what we go through is categories like the ones I've listed below with kids. We'll say, look, what do you like doing for others or for your family that makes you feel good? Not a lot of kids necessarily go with that category. It's one of the reasons why we put it first. Then the next category is, what do you like to do that you enjoy? What do you like to do that you enjoy by yourself? What do you like to do with other people? Another question that I ask about that is what do you like to do that's on screens that you enjoy? What do you like to do that's not on screens that you enjoy? And if kids say, I don't know what to do not on screens that I enjoy, because unfortunately that's a, uh, something that we hear often from kids these days, I'll often go online with them and we'll do Google searches of like non-screen activities that we can find fun. Or we'll look at like books that have like daring activities for kids that you can do either outside or that you can do uh, at home. Um, oftentimes that ends up going into arts and crafts and creative things, stuff like that. We'll also talk about social activities you can do safely right now. Uh, we'll talk about mastery activities. So we talk to people like, what's a hobby you want to take up? What's something you want to get better at? The number of kids who I've seen who are starting to learn tap dancing through YouTube videos or who are starting to learn guitar, or there's a kid that I work with who's learning ukulele through online lessons that are free that they found on YouTube. These are all things that we can figure out, like how can we learn these particular skills? Or I will say there's another kid that I work with as well who's gotten super good at origami and has started uh, actually mailing me through snail mail stuff that I can then either blow up or unfold. It's amazing. And then we also look at physical activities. This goes back to both basic wellness practices and it goes back to what people can do in and around their home that gets them moving and that also leads to increased, improved mood. The next, day, next thing we think about and again, I'm, I'm going to spend about three more minutes on this before we go to questions. 
The, the next thing that we think about related to behavioral activation is oftentimes what will happen is somebody will create a list of activities and they'll say, this is going to be mood boosting. And then we'll talk to them the next week and they'll say, oh my gosh, I couldn't find time to do that. And that's true of all humans. It is difficult for all of us. Any of you on, on this particular presentation are likely to think, okay, how many times you set an exercise goal? How many times you set a hydration goal? or an eating goal that you said to yourself, I'm gonna do this, or a sleep goal, or a time you're gonna turn off screens, and then a week later you're like, eh, I didn't really do exactly what I was thinking. That is true of every human. We're great at setting fantastic goals, but we, we have a hard time figuring out what incremental things we need to do to reach them. So the next thing that we do, particularly with older kids and young adults, is we say to ourselves, how can we be smart about these goals? What days of the week will you do it? When will you do it? What time? Are there any preparations? Do you need to pack a bag? Do you need to have materials? Is there anything to get in the way? What you can be contingency plan for what's gonna get in the way? Also, if it's not something you're motivated toward, like if it's something like, you know, you're gonna eat really healthy food, you know, three days, but you really don't like some of the healthy food you're gonna be eating, what are you gonna reward yourself with otherwise that'll help you to be motivated toward that particular goal? Asking kids those questions, particularly older kids, really helps us to make sure that we actually can facilitate goal achievement during the, the week. So this is the last kind of set of skills I'm gonna talk about before we get to kind of the question and answer here, which is that when we talk about skills like emotion monitoring, when we talk about skills like behavior activation, it's a very active kind of coping mechanism. It's that we're really looking at our feelings and kind of how we track that data. And then we're also looking at like how we then create perhaps different feelings by the behaviors we engage in. That's what we call the second wave in psychology. It's very active coping strategies to suggest that you can change things. Now going back to that serenity prayer that I referenced earlier, sometimes you just can't change things. Sometimes the situation is not something you can change. Sometimes your coping strategies aren't working. And in those situations we try to teach people are what characterizes the third wave of behavioral strategies in psychology, what's happened over the last two decades which is that everyone has urges or feelings or things that have big, intense, and comfortable emotions associated with them. We know that no feeling lasts forever. We know that no feeling's intensity lasts forever. So we try to help people to think about is how they can ride the wave or tolerate that distress or accept that they might not be able to make themselves feel differently in that moment. And there are different strategies to do that. One of the ways that people do it, at least today, is through mindfulness. Now, mindfulness takes many forms. And the reason why I include this brief note is that for some people, just reflecting on their breath or being able to just sit in a place in nature and think about their five senses and kind of reflect on their experience really helps. But for other people, they really need a voice or someone to lead them through it, either because they have difficulty capturing the kind of, kind of self-compassion that's needed for a mindful practice in that they feel like they're doing it wrong or they feel like there must be some better way to do it. And in many ways for people who feel that way, it can be helpful to be led in that mindfulness practice, whether it's through a guided meditation, uh, progressive muscle relaxation, a body scan, which is my preferred uh, thing, which is that you, know, you just can Google three minute body scan. And then what someone will do is lead you through relaxing different parts of your body. That is what helps me the most. Uh, or it can be through something like yoga or Pilates. But what we try to do with kids is do become like data scientists for this kind of practice. So when a kid, when I introduce the strategy to a kid, frequently kids say like, I don't know that I'm going to feel better just by riding the wave or by like doing a one minute, you know, mindfulness practice. And I say, fine, let's be scientists about this. Let's just listen to a meditation on Calm, which is one app we might use, or Shine, which is actually a great app because it focuses on uh, meditations or guided meditations in which uh, there's more diverse voices leading the meditations. Um, but Calm or Shine or any other number of apps can give you the opportunity to say to a, a kid, look, we're going to do a one minute and we're just going to see how we feel after this. And I can guarantee you, I've used this with hundreds of patients. Um, there has never been a patient who at the end of it has not said something to the effect of that felt really different or I get it. Like there's something there if they try that. And you know, it's something that the two of you can try together. Uh, the last thing I'll throw out there related to mindfulness is for younger kids, sometimes it can be difficult to help them focus on say a one minute or three minute body scan or focusing on their breathing. That's absolutely true. What we tend to do for younger kids, particularly those in early elementary school all the way down to pre-K, is we create things like a self-soothe kit as part of the ways that we tolerate distress. So in moments when we can't change a situation, what we focus on are the five senses, and how can we create like a lunchbox 
that has things that'll, that'll kind of activate our five senses and that might help us to get through like a stressful moment where the kid can consult the lunchbox in a moment where they might not be able to change the situation or they've got to get through something. And it's how can we make it so that there's something that they might see or look at that they find to be de-stressing? Are there ways to hear or listen to something they find de-stressing? Is there some texture that they find would help them to de-stress? Is there something that they can taste that's approved by their caregivers that uh, uh, would help them to, to de-stress? And then similarly, is there a smell or an aromatherapy of some kind that would help them to self-soothe? I will say, we talk about this for young kids because oftentimes coping is so much more concrete, but many adults find creating their own self-soothe kit is massively helpful. Um, so as we move into the question and answer portion of this talk, what I wanna just throw out there for all of you is as you're listening to the questions or as you're listening to me answer them, Focus on this slide. From today's keynote, I've gone through at my, my trademark kind of hypomanic pace with very busy slides, a number of strategies. What are two that stick with you that you'd like to take and apply with your mentees? Using the illustration around smart goal setting at the right, you can take a couple of minutes to map out how you're gonna be smart in your application of this goal. What I want you to think about as well is who can keep you accountable. Is another mentor, another person in your organization? How will you check in with yourself on your progress on this goal? And who are you gonna reach out to if you need additional support or if you need someone to consult with you on how you're applying this strategy? So again, that's the reflection that I will leave you with as we move into questions and answers. Now, Chad, do you wanna pick out some questions and fire them? Are you gonna moderate or would you like- to I, I, I can, I mean, I think I've heard from a few folks just you know, really interested in sharing this slide deck and video with their, with their mentors, um, which we definitely can. Um, and get it out to you so you can share it and, and have, you know, have them look at it and ask you questions. Um, but we can open it up for questions now if folks have questions. Um, if not, I can ask a couple too. But if you just want to take yourself off mute and, or you can, you can just go for it. This is our time. We have about 10 minutes here um, to, to ask any questions we want to Dave. Does anybody have anything off the top of their head? And I'll also open it up and say that it can be about what I've talked about here or pretty much any question you have about mental health for kids and adolescents. I'll take anything. Um, Mike, Foot, do you, do you want to actually just, are you able to unmute and just ask that question? Are you put yeah. that? <laughs> yeah, sure, Dave. It's so great to uh, hear and learn from you uh, today. This is such a great presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I was wondering if you could kind of apply what you've gone through today um, to specifically address talking with kids about um, death and dying, especially when it's a very real possibility on the horizon for, uh, for their loved ones. Um, we, we have a couple of situations like that. Um, and I'm just curious kind of what, and you know, I'm sure it, it, it changes based on age. Um, but my sense is in some ways helping youth, you know, prepare or you know for tough conversations rather than what seems to often happen is kind of a surprise or a springing of things yeah so you know there's a couple things one is that you know the talking points don't tend to change even based on on development uh related to death and dying in terms of preparing kids for it so related to those talking points that I talked about earlier for, for talking to youth, uh, I actually included, because I get that question so frequently, so Mike, it's like you're reading my mind about talking to young children during COVID. Um, it is really you know, important that we mention that death is possibly something that can occur from this sickness. And that what we talk about you know, with kids and with teenagers is that their risk of dying from this disease is not high, but that it is high for older adults or for people who have health conditions that might make them more vulnerable. And so some of the really important things just in terms of prep are to let kids know that this affects the world around them because also that means it won't blindside. And many young kids, you know, we've gotten lots of concerns where adults will say, my kid then asked, like how people have died of COVID? And the answer is yes. A significant number of people have died across the world from this disease. And what we keep going back to is it's really helpful to share with kids the facts validate their emotional reactions and then kind of welcome questions. Similarly, when you have to inform kids of a death, it's the same thing. It's that we tell parents, for, we tell caregivers, we tell any adult who's, who's interacting with a kid, set the emotional tone, you know, in the sense that you can be very kind of emotional about the particular person who's been lost. You absolutely can be showing them that you're crying or that you're sad. We generally tell adults that you want to stay at least in kind of a, a certain zone of emotionality where you're not 
uh, at a point where you're so distraught that you can't really be there for the kid, but it's perfectly fine to show them your emotions. Then you provide them with simple facts and then you, you kind of wait. You, you wait for their emotional reactions, you welcome their questions. So in that sense, it's telling them, you know, I, I wanted to let you know, you know, someone within our program or someone that you know, someone within your community has died, you know, it's because of the coronavirus or, or anything else really. Um, and what you're trying to do is, you know, you open up space for the kid to express their emotions. If the kid doesn't express their emotions, you tend to model your own very briefly. Like you might say, I just want you to know, like I'm feeling really sad about this. I'm also feeling really angry because I just wish something like this didn't exist. And I, I wouldn't be so frustrated to see that, you know, people are dying of this sickness. And so you kind of, you can narrate your own emotional uh, reactions. And then you, you welcome any further conversation they might want to go into. So young kids tend to go into being really personally focused. So they'll ask questions about whether or not they or their family members are at risk or that if they're going to die. Or young kids just get distracted, which can be very jarring for adults in that the young child has just been told about a, a death and the kid says, okay, so we're going to play kickball now. And that's perfectly normal. With older kids, they can want to cope by themselves. That's not necessarily a bad thing. They can want to cope through distraction. But the key at the end of that conversation is to let them know that you're here, you're available, and that you're gonna keep checking in. One of the biggest things that we talk about related to the grieving process is that it is important that when kids grieve, they get back into routines, uh, and that that's not, that's not necessarily, for example, uh, you know, stopping the grieving process or inhibiting it. It's more that people grieve in all kinds of different ways, and it's, it's okay to keep kind of going through emotions with routines, People don't have to just sit with their feelings, stop everything, and, and grieve. And I think that's, it's difficult for adults to kind of know where to take cues. The last thing I'll say, Mike, is that on our website, childmind.org, we have hundreds and hundreds of articles for people about how to support kids through mental health difficulties. One of the things we have that you can Google is trauma guides after a death or a difficult event that provide recommendations for parents, caregivers, people who are working with kids uh, about how to talk to kids and that resummarize the talking points I'm talking about here. So we probably have time for another question or two. Yeah, and yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll share uh, the link to Child Mind as we, when we, we share this recording and the slides as well, so you all have that. Um, Pat, do you want to ask your question? Pat. Sure, I had to unmute myself there. Um, so I'm thinking of a couple kids when I asked this question, how would a mentor best mentor a busy teen who is leaning more and more towards calling and texting and less on in-person meetings? And when I say busy, I mean these kids have school, they have extracurricular, they have family meetings and you know, it's, it's crazy. Right. No, I mean, look, one of the difficulties with the teenage developmental stage is that as deeply meaningful as some adults might be to a kid in the early parts of their life, it's totally normal for them to become more independent, for them to differentiate, rely few, less on adults, rely more on their peers. And it's, it's really difficult for any of us who care about kids to watch that happen and to feel like they're not, you know, seeming to see the same kind of significance in this relationship. What I keep throwing out there to anybody who's interacting with a teen is, just keeping on showing up. So in that sense, like, look, they've got a busy schedule. You know, if it's an in-person kind of uh, uh, meeting that we're thinking about, it, it's just telling them that you're open to almost anything that might happen. Like if they say to you, you know, look, you know, if, if you show up on Sunday morning, you know, I got to go do <laughs> a couple errands and I got to go see my buddy, fine. I'll walk into your buddy's house. That's it. Like we'll, we'll hang out for that walk. Uh, or if they say that, you know, their, their schedule is too crazy, you know, with extracurriculars, you know, look, you got to eat dinner Wednesday night. I know after soccer practice, you got to eat dinner. I'm just going to show up. I'm going to bring you the food. Like, that's it. And it feels, it feels a little weird because like, we might feel like the kid is supposed to kind of be a little bit more gracious and maybe like open themselves up to us. Cause after all, we're really trying here, but that's where you show up. And oddly enough for most teenagers, you know, they, they tend to respect that, that, you just showing up in those kind of informal situations. They'll open up, they'll talk to you about what's going on. They may not necessarily see it with the same significance that you do, but that's where you're gonna see the connection. And what, is, what I absolutely emphasize to people interacting with teens in those situations is they will call on you when they get into deep trouble. So in that sense, 
you know, <laughs> there was a patient I worked with once where literally uh, I told him, it was a, a patient I worked with in LA and I was doing home visits with this kid. And uh, we would have our session, talk with his grandma, who was his caregiver a little bit. And then I would tell him that the last 10 minutes of the session were his to do whatever activity he wanted to do. And he'd say, I want you to walk me to the liquor store to meet my friends. This kid was 14. I did not want to facilitate the activities that were occurring at the liquor store. I didn't necessarily want to have him connect with that peer group, but that was what I did. And when that kid got into some deep trouble at school and with that peer group and needed to extricate himself from that, have an advocate, you know, help figure out how he could kind of get back on track, he texted me. And that's what I'm looking for. It's, it's that kind of connection where, you know, it may not have seemed like it was that significant at the time, but it was. Pat, I hope that answers with some suggestion. Last question, perhaps. Chad, do you see Any, it? Yeah, anybody have another question? In that case, Dave, I, I have one question for you. I, I think that if you don't mind, if we do one more. I, sure. I, I just think that I'd be curious to hear how to navigate, how a mentorship can navigate the differences of how they're responding to COVID versus how a family and the caregivers are responding to COVID and how to balance that as you talk to the child with different perspectives and different views. So are, are you speaking of kind of like the idea that if someone is looking at the pandemic, and you know, perhaps you have different kind of public health practices or different agreements related to you know, how serious the virus is or how serious it is to adhere to certain things. Um, you know, I, think, I think we're getting this a, a lot. Um, you know, what I think it comes down to is how people set boundaries for themselves and, and how they can you know, advocate for those things. So when we see those discrepancies happening in communities right now, you know, one of the things is that people can hide at some level behind the organization they work for. So like I work with a mentor organization in Harlem where mentors have said, you know, we're seeing very different practices. And part of this may be due to the fact that a family either doesn't believe or doesn't want to adhere to certain guidelines. Part of it is due to the fact that some families have been working through the entire pandemic as if nothing is different because it, it really hasn't been different. Their jobs are essential. Uh, their kids have continued to need to go uh, to different places. So there's, there's been no real uh, change in, in certain lifestyles. And in those situations, sometimes the mentors can hide behind their, I don't say hide, but more that like they can utilize their organizational guidelines as a way of saying like, look, you don't have to do this at home, but when you come to our baseball field for some of the activities that we're having, or when you, when you hang out with your mentor, you know, these are the guidelines for the organization. That, that we need to engage in. And, and that can really help to just have that kind of like more collective protection. I think the other thing too is that we, we coach people on being respectfully boundary. So it's kind of saying like, listen, man, I really wanna spend time with you, uh, you know, but for me, uh, in order for me to feel like, you know, we can spend that time together, uh, my hope is that both of us can maybe cover our faces and we can do something outside. And, and that would just, that would help me to feel safe, even though I know that like within your family, you might be doing something different. And it's really that we're not getting at the premise of those practices, which people may significantly disagree on or may tie to political causes. It's more that we're getting at who we are as individuals. This is what helps me feel safe. In the same way that like we think about, you know, different levels that adults may feel safe with kids and just in general. Like some adults feel perfectly safe letting a kid be independent, climbing up on big tall rocks or climbing trees. And some adults do not feel safe with that. And that's perfectly fine. Like kids can adapt to that about the adults that they're with. And as long as we can kind of be respectful of differing views while at the same time saying what makes us feel safe just in our interactions, that can often be the kind of solution moving forward. Great. Well, Dave, thank you so much for, for joining us today and, and sharing your knowledge and answering our questions. We really appreciate it. And I think folks are really excited to share this with their mentors as well and, and take what they've learned from this. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, folks. Privileged to be with you here. And uh, we can share the slides widely and also uh, find many more resources on my organization's website childmind.org and they're all free so go go check it out all right thanks Sid. thanks folks Alrighty. bye everybody